section three chapters thirteen through fifteen of the three sisters by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirteen in the low-lighted room the thing that gwenda carteret had seen lay stretched in the middle of the great bed covered with a sheet the bed with its white mound was so much too big for the four walls that held it the white plaster of the ceiling bulging above it stooped so low that the body of john greatorex lay as if already closed up in its tomb jim greatorex his son sat on a wooden chair at the head of the bed his young handsome face was loose and flushed as if he had been drinking his eyes the queer blue wide-open eyes that had hitherto looked out at you from their lodging in that ruddy sensuous face incongruously spiritual high and above your head like the eyes of a dreamer and a mystic jim's eyes were sunken now and darkened in their red and swollen lids they stared at the rug laid down beside the bed while jim's mind set itself to count stupidly and obstinately the snippets of grey and scarlet cloth that made the pattern on the black every now and then he would recognize a snippet as belonging to some suit his father had worn years ago and then jim's brain would receive a shock and would stagger and have to begin its counting all over again the door opened to let rowcliffe in and at the sound of the door as if a spring had been suddenly released in his spine jim greatorex shot up and started to his feet well greatorex good evening dr rowcliffe he came forward awkwardly hanging his head as if detected in an act of shame there was a silence while the two men turned their backs upon the bed determined to ignore what was on it they stood together by the window pretending to stare at things out there in the night and so they became aware of the men carrying the coffin they could no longer ignore it will you look at him doctor better not rowcliffe would have laid his hand on the young man's arm muttering a refusal but greatorex had moved to the bed and drawn back the sheet what gwenda carteret had seen was revealed the dead man's face upturned with a slight tilt to the ceiling that bulged so brutally above it the stiff dark beard accentuating the tilt the eyes also upturned white under their unclosing lids the nostrils the half-open mouth preserved their wonder and their terror before a thing so incredible that the walls and roof of a man's room should close round him and suffocate him on this horrified face there were the marks of dissolution and at the corners of the grim beard and moustache a stain it left nothing to be said it was the face of the man who had drunk hard and had told his son that he had never been the worse for drink jim greatorex stood and looked at it as if he knew what rowcliffe was thinking of and defied him to think rowcliffe drew up the sheet and covered it you better come out of this it isn't good for you he said i know what's good for me dr rowcliffe jim stuck his hands in his breeches and gazed stubbornly at the sheeted mound come rowcliffe said don't give way like this buck up and be a man a man you wait till your turn comes doctor my turn came ten years ago and it may come again and you'll know then what good it does talkin he paused listening they've come he said there was a sound of scuffling on the stone floor below and on the stairs mrs gale's voice was heard out on the landing calling to the men easy with it easy mind the lamp eh you'll never get it up that road you might coax it round a corner a swinging thud on the stone wall then more and more desperate scuffling with muttering then silence mrs gale put her head in at the door jimmy you might come and give a hand with the coffin they've got it fast in the turn of the stair through the open doorway rowcliffe could see the broad shoulders of the coffin jammed in the stairway jim flushed with resentment strode out and the struggling and scuffling began again subdued this time and respectful rowcliffe went out to help mrs gale on the landing went on talking to herself they should have brought trestles up first there's no place to stand it in eh dear it's job enough getting it up what'll it be getting it down again with he lying in it here you get under it jimmy and heave it up jim crouched and went backward down the stair under the coffin his flushed face with its mournful mystic eyes 
looked out at rowcliffe with a moment under the coffin head then with a heave of his great back and pushing with his powerful arms against the wall and stair-rail he loosened the shoulders of the coffin and bore it steadied by rowcliffe and the men up the stair and into the room they set it on its feet beside the bed propped against the wall and jim greatorex stood and stared at it rowcliffe went down into the kitchen followed by mrs gale what do you think of jimmy dr rowcliffe he oughtn't to be left alone isn't there any sister or anybody who could come to him no he's got no sisters jimmy hasn't well you must get him to lie down and eat get him you can do nothing with jimmy he'll go his own road his father and he well, they was always quarrelling you might say yet when the old gentleman was taken bad jimmy he couldn't do too much for him he was set on pulling his father round when he found he couldn't keep the old gentleman he gets it on his mind like broodin and he's got nout to comfort him she sat down to it now you see dr rawcliffe jim's father and his grandfather before him they was good wesleyans it's in the blood but jim's mother that died she was church and that slip of a lass when john greatorex come courtin she turned him he was that soft with lasses her father he was steward to lord of the manor and he was church and all the family same as the folk up at manor you might say jim greatorex he's got no religion neither church nor chapel he is not to comfort him upstairs the scuffling and the struggling became frightful jim's feet and jim's voice were heard above the muttering of the undertaker's men mrs gale whispered they're gettin him in he's given a hand with the body that's something she brooded ponderously a sound of stamping and scraping at the back door roused her hey who's there now she asked irritably willie the farm lad appeared on the threshold his face was flushed and scared where's jim he said in a thick voice Oosh! don't you know the coffin's come he's upstairs with the old master well he might come down the mare's taken bad again in her inside the mare daisy yes ah eh dear there's no end to trouble you go up and fetch jimmy willie hesitated his flush deepened i daresn't he whispered hoarsely poor lad he's frightened of the body she explained you stay there willie i'll go the body's nout to me i've seen too many of they she muttered as she went they heard her crying excitedly overhead jimmy you come to the mare you come to the mare the sounds in the room ceased instantly jim greatorex alert and in violent possession of all his faculties dashed down the stairs and out into the yard rowcliffe followed into the darkness where his horse and trap stood waiting for him he was lighting his lamps when jim greatorex appeared beside him with a lantern dr rawcliffe will you just come and take a look at little mare jim's sullenness was gone his voice revealed him humble and profoundly agitated rowcliffe sighed smiled pulled himself together and turned with greatorex into the stable in the sodden straw of her stall daisy the mare lay heaving and snorting after her agony from time to time she turned her head toward her tense and swollen flank seeking with eyes of anguish the mysterious source of pain the feed of oats with which willie had tried to tempt her lay untouched in the skip beside her head i give her they oats an hour ago said willie she hasn't so much as nosed em nobody but a dom gowpy would a done that with her stomach raw you might a killed the mare willie appalled by his own deed and depressed stooped down and fondled the mare's face to show that it was not affection that he lacked here clear out of that and let doctor have a look in willie slunk aside as rowcliffe knelt with greatorex in the straw and examined the sick mare can you tell at all what's amiss doctor colic i should say has the vet seen her yes he sent up something well have you given it her jim's voice thickened i should have given it her yesterday and why on earth didn't you the damned thing went clean out of my head he turned to the window ledge by the stable door where among a confusion of cobwebs and dusty bottles and tin cans the drench of turpentine and linseed oil the little phial of chlorodyne and the clean tin pannikin with its wide protruding mouth stood ready all gleaming in the lantern light forgotten since the day before that's the stuff will you help me give it her doctor all right can you hold her that i can come up daisy come up 
steer my beauty gently gently old lass rowcliffe took off his coat and shook up the drench and poured it into the pannikin while greatorex got the struggling mare on to her feet together with gentleness and dexterity they cajoled her then jim laid his hands upon her mouth and opened it drawing up her head against his breast willie suddenly competent held the lantern while rowcliffe poured the drench down her throat daisy coughing and dribbling stood and gazed at them with sad and terrified eyes and while the undertaker's men screwed down the lid upon john greatorex in his coffin jim greatorex his son watched with daisy in her stall and stephen rowcliffe watched with him nursing the sick mare making up a fresh clean bed for her rubbing and fomenting her swollen and tortured belly when daisy rolled in another agony rowcliffe gave her chlorodyne and waited till suddenly she lay still in jim's face as he looked down at her there was an infinite tenderness and pity and compunction rowcliffe wriggling into his coat regarded him with curiosity and wonder till jim drew himself up and fixed him with his queer unhappy eyes shall i save her doctor i can't tell you yet i'd better send the vet up to-morrow hadn't i ay jim's voice was strangled in the spasm of his throat but he took rowcliffe's hand and wrung it discharging many emotions in that one excruciating grip rowcliffe pointed to the little phial of chlorodyne lying in the straw if i were you he said i shouldn't leave that lying about through his long last night in the grey house haunted by the moon john greatorex lay alone screwed down under a coffin lid and his son jim wrapped in a horse blanket and with his head on a haysack lay in the straw of the stable beside daisy his mare from time to time as his mood took him he turned and laid his hand on her in a poignant caress as if she had been his first-born or his bride he spoke to her in the thick soft voice of passion with pitiful broken words and mutterings what is it daisy what is it there did they then did they my beauty my little lass i was a damned brute to forget that a damned brute all that night and the next night he lay beside her the funeral passed like a fantastic interlude between the long acts of his passion his great sorrow made him humble to mrs gale so that he allowed her to sustain him with food and drink and on the third day it was known throughout garthdale that young greatorex who had lost his father had saved his mare only stephen rowcliffe knew that the mare had saved young greatorex and the little phial of chlorodyne was put back among the cobwebs and forgotten chapter fourteen down at the vicarage the vicar was wrangling with his youngest daughter for the third time alice declared that she was not well and that she didn't want her milk whether you want it or not you've got to drink it said the vicar alice took the glass in her lap and looked at it am i to stand over you till you drink it alice put the rim of the glass to her mouth and shuddered i can't she said it'll make me sick leave the poor child alone papa said gwenda but the vicar ignored gwenda you'll drink it if i stand here all night he said alice struggled with a spasm in her throat he held the glass for her while she groped piteously oh where's my hanky with superhuman clemency he produced his own it'll serve you right if i'm ill said alice come said the vicar in his wisdom and his patience come he proffered the disgusting cup again i'd drink it and have done with it if i were you said mary in her soft voice mary's soft voice was too much for alice why can't you leave me alone you you beast mary she sobbed and mr carteret began again am i to stand here alice got up she broke loose from them and left the room you might have known she wasn't going to drink it gwenda said but the vicar never knew when he was beaten she would have drunk it he said if mary hadn't interfered alice had not got the pneumonia that killed john greatorex such happiness she reflected was not for her she had desired it too much but she was doing very well with her anemia bloodless and slender and inert she dragged herself about the village she could not get away from it because of the steep hills she would have had to climb a small unhappy ghost she haunted the fields in the bottom and the path along the beck that led past mrs gale's cottage the sight of alice was more than ever annoying to the vicar only you wouldn't have known it 
as she grew whiter and weaker he braced himself and became more hardy and robust when he caught her lying on the sofa he spoke to her in a robust and hearty tone don't lie there all day my girl get up and go out what you want is a good blow on the moor yes if i didn't die before i got there alice would say while she thought serve him right too if i did and the vicar would turn from her in disgust he knew what was the matter with his daughter alice at dinner-time he would pull himself together again for after all he was her father he was robust and hearty over the sirloin and the leg of mutton he would call for a glass and press into it the red juice of the meat don't peek and pine girl drink that it'll put some blood into you and alice would refuse to drink it next she refused to drink her milk at eleven she carried it out to essie in the scullery i wish you'd drink my milk for me essie it makes me sick she said i don't want your milk said essie please she implored her but essie was angry her face flamed and she banged down the dishes she was drying i shall not drink it what should i want your milk for you can pour it in the pig's bucket and the milk would be left by the scullery window till it turned sour and essie poured it into the pig's bucket that stood under the sink three weeks passed and with every week alice grew more bloodless more slender and more inert and more and more like an unhappy ghost her small face was smaller there was a tinge of green in its honey whiteness and of mauve in the dull rose of her mouth and under her shallow breast her heart seemed to rise up and grow large while the rest of alice shrank and grew small it was as if her fragile little body carried an enormous engine an engine of infernal and terrifying power when she lay down and when she got up and with every sudden movement its throbbing shook her savagely night and morning she called to her sister oh gwenda come and feel my heart i do believe it's growing it's getting too big for my body it frightens me when it jumps about like that it frightened gwenda but it did not really frighten alice she rejoiced in it rather and exulted after all it was a good thing that she had not got pneumonia which might have killed her as it had killed john greatorex she had got what served her purpose better it served all her purposes if she had tried she could not have hit on anything that would have annoyed her father more or put him more conspicuously in the wrong to begin with it was his doing he had worried her into it and he had brought her to a place which was the worst place conceivable for anybody with a diseased heart since you couldn't stir out of doors without going uphill night and morning alice stood before the looking-glass and turned out the lining of her lips and eyelids and saw with pleasure the pale rose growing paler every other hour she laid her hand on her heart and took again the full thrill of its dangerous throbbing or felt her pulse to assure herself of the halt the jerk the hurrying of the beat night and morning and every other hour she thought of rowcliffe if it goes on like this they'll have to send for him she said but it had gone on the three weeks had passed and yet they had not sent the vicar had put his foot down he wouldn't have the doctor he knew better than a dozen doctors what was the matter with his daughter alice alice said nothing she simply waited as if some profound and dead sure instinct had sustained her she waited sickening and on the last night of the third week she fainted she had dragged herself upstairs to bed staggered across the little landing and fallen on the threshold of her room they kept her in bed next day at one o'clock she refused her chicken broth she would neither eat nor drink and a little before three gwenda went for the doctor she had not told alice she was going she had not told anybody chapter fifteen she had to walk for mary had taken her bicycle nobody knew where mary had gone or when she had started or when she would be back but the four miles between garth and morfe were nothing to gwenda who would walk twenty for her own amusement she would have stretched the way out indefinitely if she could she would have piled garthdale moor on greffington edge and carva on the top of them and put them between garth and morfe so violent was her fear of stephen rowcliffe she had no longer any desire to see him or to be seen by him he had seen her twice too often and too early and too late after being caught on the moor at dawn it was preposterous that she should show herself in the doorway of upthorne at night how was he to know that she hadn't done it on purpose girls did these things poor little ally had done them 
and it was because ally had done them that she had been taken and hidden away here where she couldn't do them any more but couldn't she gwenda stood still staring in her horror as the frightful thought struck her that ally could and that she would the very minute she realized young rowcliffe and he would think not that it mattered in the least what he thought he would think that there were two of them if only she said to herself if only young rowcliffe were a married man then even ally couldn't not that she blamed poor little ally she looked on little ally as the victim of a malign and tragic tendency the fragile vehicle of an alien and overpowering impulse little ally was doomed it wasn't her fault if she was made like that and this time it wouldn't be her fault at all their father would have driven her gwenda hated him for his persecution and exposure of the helpless creature she walked on thinking it wouldn't end with ally they were all three exposed and persecuted for supposing it wasn't likely but supposing that this rowcliffe man was the sort of man she liked supposing what was still more unlikely that he was the sort of man who would like her where would be the good of it her father would spoil it all he spoiled everything well no to be perfectly accurate not everything there was one thing he had not spoiled because he had never suspected its existence her singular passion for the place of course if he had suspected it he would have stamped on it it was his business to stamp on other people's passions luckily it wasn't in him to conceive a passion for a place it had come upon her at first sight as they drove between twilight and night from rayburn through rathdale into garthdale it was when they had left the wooded land behind them and the moors lifted up their naked shoulders one after another darker than dark into a sky already whitening above the hidden moon and she saw morf grey as iron on its hill bearing the square crown and the triple pendants of its lights she saw the long straight line of greffington edge hiding the secret moon and carva with the ashen west behind it there was something in their form and in their gesture that called to her as if they knew her as if they waited for her they struck her with the shock of recognition as if she had known them and had waited too and close beside her own wonder and excitement she had felt the deep and sullen repulsion of her companions the vicar sat huddled in his overcoat his nostrils pinched with repugnance sniffed as they drank in the cold clean air from time to time he shuddered and a hoarse muttering came from under the grey woollen scarf he had wound round his mouth and beard he was the righteous man sent into uttermost abominable exile for his daughter's sin behind him on the back seat of the trap alice and mary cowed under their capes and rugs they had turned their shoulders to each other hostile in their misery gwenda was sorry for them the grey road dipped and turned and plunged them to the bottom of garthdale the small scattering lights of the village waited for her in the hollow with something humble and sad and familiar in their setting they too stung her with that poignant and secret sense of recognition this is the place the vicar had said he had addressed himself to alice and it had been as if he had said this the place the infernal the damnable place you brought us to with your behaviour their hatred of it had made gwenda love it you can have your old garthdale all to yourself alice had said nobody else wants it that to gwenda was the charm of it the adorable place was her own nobody else wanted it she loved it for itself it had nothing but itself to offer her and that was enough it was almost as she had said too much her questing youth conceived no more rapturous adventure than to follow the sheep over carva to set out at twilight and see the immense night come down on the high moors above upthorne to get up when alice was asleep and slip out and watch the dawn turning from grey to rose and from rose to gold above greffington edge as it happened you saw sunrise and moonrise best from the platform of morf green there greffington edge breaks and falls away and lets slip the dawn like a rosy scarf from its shoulder and sets the moon free of her earth and gives her to the open sky but just as the vicar had spoiled rowcliffe so rowcliffe had spoiled more for gwenda therefore her fear of him was mingled with resentment it was as if he had had no business to be living there in that house of his looking over the green incredible that she should have wanted to see and to know this person 
but now that she didn't want to, of course she was going to see him. At the bend of the road, within a mile of Morfe, Mary came riding on Gwenda's bicycle. Large parcels were slung from her handlebars. She had been shopping in the village. Mary, bowed forward as she struggled with an upward slope, was not aware of Gwenda, but Gwenda was aware of Mary, and not being in the mood for her, she struck off the road on to the moor and descended upon Morfe by the steep lane that leads from Carva into Rathdale. It never occurred to her to wonder what Mary had been doing in Morfe, so evident was it that she had been shopping. End of section 3 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine